It's the Crash MotoGP podcast post Austria, the second of the double headers around the Red Bull ring. And oh my, MotoGP really doesn't do things by halves, does it? Forget the fantastic track action for a second, which saw Brad Binder take a surprise win for KTM in changeable conditions. We had even more strange news, breaking news that was the talk of the town even before the weekend started. We'll try and cover it all for you here. Uh, and to digest it all with me, of course, is Keith Ewan and Pete McLaren. My name is Harry Benjamin. Now, uh, I know there is so much to cover with the race, uh, guys, but let's just rewind a few days before, as in the build-up to the weekend, Yamaha announced that Maverick Vinales was to be suspended for this round and would not be racing his bike in Austria. The reason it was revealed was because in the last few laps of the previous round at the Red Bull Ring, the Styrian Grand Prix, after a fairly frustrating race, he was basically caught trying to blow up his engine, essentially. First of all, Keith, we should say he has apologised quite emotionally to Yamaha, but it's not really on, is it, for a rider to be doing that kind of thing? I mean, how can he even come back from that? Well, you can come back from it. It depends whether Yamaha are a factory, and they're all on holiday, remember, in Japan at this time of the year. So the actual factory, it was the Yamaha Europe, I think, that took the uh, the infidus in the first place to try and ban him from this particular weekend. I mean, he's in big trouble, isn't he, in more ways than one. I mean, it, this this is not just frustration, although that's what he put it down to in his, his uh, little press conference that he had. And he is obviously very sorry for his actions, and and... He's a good lad. You've got to remember that Maverick Vinales is actually an all right guy. There's nothing wrong with Maverick Vinales. It's just that this last year or so has built up on him and it just seems to get ahead of him. He just, you know, we mentioned mental health so many times nowadays, you know, and truly there has always been mental health issues in a paddock, always. Never quite to the fore, never quite considered as much as it is now. Um, and he definitely needs a break. There is something not quite right there. I mean, what came out was obviously, if you've seen the clips, everyone at home, you know, he held the thing on the on the rev limiter. Now, great fun on a road bike, of course, where you can just sit there with it popping and banging on the rev limiter and the old ECU saves the motor from exploding. But on a racing bike, there's a slightly finer intolerance. Um, sitting there with it on the, on the rev limiter and then coming down pit lane and revving it to the rev limiter. It was an inappropriate use of the motorcycle, I think, was something along the lines of what was said. Um, and it couldn't get much more inappropriate than that. Uh, it has a safety issue, massive, not just to him, obviously, but if the thing had let go in a part of the track that, you know, is quick and someone had come flying through a whole pool of oil that the thing had, when it had thrown its lunch up um, and, and skidded off at a place like the Red Bull Ring, it could have been devastating. I mean, it's disrespectful to, to himself, to, to his team, to the fans, to other riders, to the factory he rides for. I mean, it couldn't get a bigger pile of poo that he's wandering around in at the moment. It really is an awful situation. Now, apology, will that hack it? I have a feeling it won't. Um, he's nowhere in the championship. It's not like they're going to lose a championship by by uh, extending that ban, particularly. Um, we've obviously got a situation when we get to Silverstone where it looks like Jake Dixon's going to be riding the Patronus bike. Cal Crutcho is going to be riding uh, the factory bike that is at the moment vacant. Um, that's a possibility. And, of course, it makes sense. Two British riders at the British Grand Prix it's the final round in Britain that Valentino Rossi will be a MotoGP rider. Expect big, big ticket sales. People trying to climb over fences or under them, whatever it might be. But Silverstone is going to be rammed this year just because. It looks like we're going to have two, two British guys riding in MotoGP. Valentino's last ever race. I mean, Peter, it couldn't be a bigger thing. I bet you're wishing you weren't stuck in Thailand. <laughs> exactly. I mean, we, we saw from this weekend just um, you know the, the big fans back in the grandstands and you know, the reception Valentino Rossi got, the circuit putting on the, the big sort of the helicopter and everything for the farewell for him. So, yeah, I mean, to have those... We saw the F1 race also at Silverstone. Huge number of fans there. So, yeah, it'll be a great event, as we say, going back to Vinales. What, what are they going to do now? I mean... <laughs> I think it was Valentino Rossi that said, maybe this is the straw that broke the camel's back. You know, if you took this in isolation, maybe you could get away with it. You know, he, he would get a good telling off. Don't ever do that again. But when you've already, you know, you've negotiated to leave the team at the end of the year, it's obviously a tense situation. We spoke about it before. How do you then manage if you've already said you don't want to be in the team, basically, and then you have to stay with them for the, for the last half of the season? That's difficult in itself. And then you have this going on. So, you know, the, the, they they saw the the evidence, if you like, on the telemetry and the, and the videos. They wouldn't have made this kind of call unless they were sure. So, 
what happens next? I mean, you know, it, it's the the only the only perhaps reason to maybe just wait and calm down and look at the championship table is it'll be very hard for Yamaha to win the team's championship without Vinales. They can win the riders' championship. They can win the constructors' championship because Quattararo, you know, he's doing such a good job. That's fine. But for the team's championship, it's both riders that count in each team, obviously. So that's going to be hard for Yamaha, you know, to keep hold of that. They're leading it at the moment. They're leading all three championships. They're on the way for a perfect year. Now, do they, in effect, say, OK, we're willing to perhaps sacrifice that championship because, you know, just to just to stop this situation that we're in with Maverick or do they sort of swallow their pride a bit and, and, and maybe say, well, look, do we give them a second chance? That's that's the decision they've got to make. Teams Championship, Manufacturers Championships are massive. Julian Ryder, my old partner in commentary, you know, he always used to bang the drum about the Manufacturers Championship. It's more important than the Riders Championship to the factory at the end of the day. So giving that up will be a big deal if Yamaha are prepared to do that. But the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, he is absolutely... Do you know what I find, and this is where the mental health thing comes in, what on earth did he think? I mean, these guys think faster than, than I can speak. I mean, it's, it's incredible how quick these guys think. They're on their feet. They're, they're absolutely the sharpest men in the world. So what on earth was he thinking? What, what was he thinking? What the achievement was going to be? I mean, them bikes, they know if you fart. You know, it records everything. There's nothing telemetry on those bikes. It doesn't matter what you do. It's all in the telemetry. So there was no way he was ever going to get away with it. Did he want them to fire him? Was that the was that the issue? Was it a situation where he wanted someone else to to get him out of there? You know, but I'm a top rider. Get me out of here as quick as you can, please. I mean, I I don't understand it. And but having seen his 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 apology, it seems now that he's had this realization that he might not be racing at somewhere like Silverstone, which which is a great racetrack and a, and a great event. And suddenly it's it's dawned on him. It seems like everything he's doing is knee jerk. Um, which again comes under the, the mental health issue, not not thinking rationally about what he's doing. I think Yamaha will take the risk and um, not run him. I think they're going to, I think they're going to enjoy Cal and Jake in you know Cal in the factory team at Silverstone. It would seem at the moment all the, the contacts I've had with the, the track remotely have been that that's what's going to happen. Cal on the factory bike, Jake on the Patronus bike. That you know it's it's going to be a very exciting British Grand Prix from that perspective. Um, and can't wait to get there. It's only two weeks. <laughs> so it is only two weeks. But in that respect, then, if you think he might potentially miss Silverson as well, do you think Vinales will come back at all this season? Do you think Yamaha will take this opportunity and just say, OK, no, you're done, bye? I think Pete's, Pete's hit the nail on the head when he talks about the manufacturer's um, uh, awards. I mean, they're, they're so big to the Japanese. Like I say, they're on holiday at the moment in Japan. But this will this is going to be a, you know, this week would have been a major issue. Um, yeah especially when all the footage got out there. I mean, we were hearing from still photographers, you will have done a well, Pete, for Crash, that, you know, still photographers that are around on their scooters around the track um, taking photographs, they were all wondering what on earth was going on because he was on the rev limiter. You look, at the, you look at our ridiculously simple telemetry, in other words, the sheets that come out from MotoGP every single week, and top speed was off by, by miles an hour where he was revving it out in a, in a lower gear than it should have been in. You know, you could see it on the, the top speed was you know, something like 15 kilometres an hour down in, in the places where he was over revving the thing in the wrong gear. It was madness. It was a, it was a, a moment of madness from, from Maverick Vinales. But it goes, it's got to go further than that. As far as I'm aware, he hasn't signed a deal with anybody yet. And they're all going to be thinking to themselves, what? What are we possibly taking on here? Is this guy going to... You know, the Yamaha is the best motorcycle at the moment. It's leading the world championship. You can do just about whatever you want on it and any track you want to do it on. You know, if you make it work for you, um, he obviously can't make it work for him and the team. Yeah, you know, that's the other thing. I mean, the team, can you imagine what they're like? They're working their what's-its off every single night of the week, getting these motorcycles absolutely bang on right. And there's their rider basically slapping their face. It's, it's just an awful situation. Who is going to take the risk with Maverick Vinales after this? Where is he going to go? It was interesting that the first TV station that I think he did the interview with when he kind of broke his silence was the Italian. The Italian, Italian station. And this is the feeling is that maybe some of his advisors or said, you know, a bit like Keith was saying, Maverick, you're going to have to say something, you know? And it, so it was interesting that he chose the Italians first and, and to perhaps put his side out and apologize and everything else. Let off in that interview though, Pete, didn't he really? The guy that was doing the interview didn't nail him. I mean, if it had been any of us, he'd have been nailed to the post because you, you've got to know these things. If he's coming 
public with his apology, then therefore you have got to stress him regarding that apology and ask him, you know, are you really in trouble? Are you, are you, do you need to reach out? Is there, is there something here that you need? I mean, <laughs> flicking between channels, which is what we all do, you know, when you look at the Glen Irwin piece from British Superbikes today, um, I'm glad I recorded it. I've been having a little look at it just a minute ago before we came on air here. And Glenn Irwin's mental health issues that he had a couple of years ago were serious. You know, he reached out. I mean, absolutely fair dues to Glenn. You know, our sport is, you know, it's one of them sports where no one will admit to being gay. You know, this must be the biggest group of people that I know that doesn't have a gay person in it, according to, according to the paddock. Um, when we all know that that's not going to be the case. And the same thing with mental health issues. These are almost like they're taboo issues in a motorcycle paddock still. And, and I find that, well, horrible, really. I mean, I think that, that, that you know, we know that with the stress in the paddock that there are people that, that can't cope. Mechanics, managers, riders. It is a really stressful environment where high performance of everybody, everybody's thinking, waking moment, is about high stress, is about high performance, is about getting the best out of yourself and everything else around you. And those things bring on mental health issues. Now, this is not a new thing. It's been there since my day. I can remember that, you know, people that, that suffer from this. And if you look through the, through the record books or through your memory, if you want to, there have been people that have, have left us under these circumstances that have found it too difficult. And again, you know, uh, I think that my advice to anybody that's hearing this and feeling something like vulnerable with this there are people you can reach out to even if it's just a friend or your parents or, or your you know your brother sister you know there are agencies that you can reach out to as well that that you need to be in touch with you need to be in touch with yourself and i think our paddock is only really just waking up to the fact that 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 is what you need to do you know glenn Irwin for me is a is a is a you know flag bearer in this situation i mean fair dues to the man he has stood up these are the problems i've had I've had to deal with it. This is how I've dealt with it and given advice publicly to people. I think it's brilliant. I think it's absolutely brilliant. I think it's, it's worse at the moment with pandemic. I mean, everybody's been locked down. Everybody's shut down here, there and everywhere. It doesn't matter what country you're in, what you know, ethnicity, you know, whatever you might be, everyone's under stress at the moment. There's very few people that are getting away with this lockdown situation that we've been in. The worry about your family getting sick, your worry about, you know, people close to you. All of that, on top of the fact that you're having to race motorbikes and so on and so forth, uh, it's, it's pretty stressful out there. And people do need to, to reach out if that's the situation. And if Maverick Vinyal is bringing it back to where we're going, if Maverick Vinyal is feeling uh, that far down that rabbit hole, then I think that management need to take a grip on that and management need to you know, take and make an assessment of what's going on with Maverick Vinyal and help him. You know, it's not just about helping him go fast on a racetrack. It's about helping him when he's off the bike and helping him ride that motorbike the best he can. And I think that, you know, somebody somewhere, it's already all very well castigating him. And we've already said that he's been disrespectful. He's been bad. He's been this, he's been that. But there's got to be bigger underlying reasons for that. And so people need to look into that and need to work that out. They don't need to just ban him per se because that, you know, could ruin the man's life forever. Um, so I think there's, there's so much more to this. I'm not qualified in any way, shape or form. Um, but I'm, I've been observing it for a great number of years and I have seen some people that can't cope with it. And Maverick Vinales may just be one of them at this stage. It's so easy, I think, to forget that these, uh, these people are, are just human beings at the end of the day as well. You know, they're, they're athletes and they, we put them all up on this pedestal and we watch them go racing for our entertainment. But you do forget that you don't see all the other stuff that goes on. So... I like to think, I think we all like to think, we all echo, of course, what Pete said, but, you know, he's hopefully got the right people around him and, and Yamaha, you know, if, if they're smart enough, as you say, you know, he, yes, he's made some bad decisions and he should be punished for those, but why have they come about and can they help him to get out of those troubles? If it's not the Yamaha, can his team around him do that? So we, it'll be an interesting one to uh, to monitor, I think, as as the weeks uh, go by, but uh, I think we all echo what what you said there, Keith. Um, so that was the the huge storm, I suppose, that uh, engulfed the weekend to begin with, and then we had another bit of a blow, I think, actually, because we're talking about some rider changes potentially for Silverstone. One of those at the uh, Petronas SRT team, with potentially we think Jake Dixon coming in there, but Petronas announcing they are going to end their sponsorship 
of the SRT team in MotoGP and then of course shutting down I think the Moto2 and Moto3 operations it's, it's a big blow isn't it Keith? Always more to it than what there appears to be that's a fact this will have been going on for some time um, I believe that Razan Razali, Joe and Stiggerfeld will have been aware of this potential break point. Um, what they will have been trying to do is put together another replacement backer, and obviously they haven't been able to do that. And there comes a point where you have got to be able to talk to your people, so you give them half a chance to find jobs and so on and so forth. We're talking about two major sides, you know, two-thirds of their team is 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 not going to be anywhere fairly soon. And uh, I don't think anybody, it was a, a surprise. It was a bigger shock than anything, I've got to say, that, that Patronus suddenly announced that. But have they had the best out of the deal? If you look at it at the end of the day, brand spanking new team, big bucks, Blasted onto the MotoGP scene. John McPhee won their first race. You know, he was the first winner in the Patronus Sepang International team uh, for Moto3. Good PR out of Moto2 as well. Fabio Quattararo, been an absolute star for them in the, in the MotoGP camp. I mean, there, there may be other reasons for it as well. I mean, Patronus, obviously, being Malaysian, you know, the Malaysian angle didn't pick up, did it? it we, we didn't find a Malaysian rider that's coming through their, their routes, and that will be... That will be an issue as well when you're trying to sell something, you know, to your uh, to your board. But all big companies have a strategy and a timeline for that strategy, and they all have breakpoints at some stage. And clearly, that's been reached. It's got to where they feel, you know, they've done as much as they can do with where it is. They had the icon that is Valentino Rossi sign on. That was, you know, that's an interesting dimension i mean it's as much negative as it is positive if you ask me in as much as the team haven't performed in that side of the garage you know because valentino is not on the kind of form that they might have hoped that he would have been as, uh, to match his big name um the fact that valentino's retiring this year patronas pull out at the same time there's some kind of you know linkage there i suppose as well i mean it's I think the, the, the main thing from my perspective is, is that knowing big companies and having dealt with them before on big sponsorship deals, that will have been planned. That won't be, a, it won't be as knee-jerk as it appears. Um, the only reason it hasn't been announced prior is because they've been given um, the Sepang International Race Team time to try and put something else in place. Clearly, they haven't been able to do that. The funding they have will carry them through in MotoGP, but not funding Moto3 and Moto2 at the same time. So um, it's a demise of a, you know... <laughs> Well, I mean, only things like yesterday when that team was formed. They had, what, three or four months to get a workshop round and get every, all the personnel on board. And it was at the same time when KTM was sucking all the top techs out of the paddock, weren't they? Because KTM were expanding their stuff. So really, really a fantastic job and not an easy time to, to achieve what they achieved from, from a, a technical point of view. You know, like I say, KTM were really sucking the guts out. I mean, uh, Repsol Honda lost, I don't know how many people that went to, to KTM as well. So... So I think Patronus, you know, Sepang International Racing Team have done a fantastic job. And you've got to feel a bit sorry for them, haven't you, Pete? Absolutely, absolutely. And as you say, Keith, Patronus were an integral part of the whole move to MotoGP, weren't they? I mean, the, you know, this came about because Patronus were willing to fund it from the start. It wasn't that the, the, the Sepang team were going and then they looked for a sponsor. You know, Patronus were there right from the beginning when all of the talks of, well, can we do it? Yes, we're interested. OK. And then Razan went ahead and, you know, knowing that he had the, the Patronus backing him, went ahead and, and, and did the deals, if you like. So it is quite a surprise as, as to why the, the contract is ending this year. So it's, it's not like they're, they're cutting and running or anything like that. It's just they're not going to extend it. As Keith said, you know, there will be reasons for that. All we hear is the sort of the marketing, well, we've achieved everything we set out to achieve. I mean, is that true? I mean, it, it depends on what they're aiming for, doesn't it? But it's hard to see, you know, it's been such a success story. So it's hard to see an exact reason as to why they would want to quit now. You know, they've they, they've had great success with the MotoGP team. OK, this year has not gone so well. But as Keith said, they've got, you know, Valentino Rossi in his final year. Yamaha are paying his wages. You know, you, if you are offered the most famous motorcycle rider in history and you don't have to pay his wages, and I mean, every picture, every montage of Valentino Rossi's career that comes out in the next 50 years will end with him in Patronus livery, won't it? I mean, it's, you know, it was a fantastic, just on the marketing terms, they've had a fantastic exposure from that alone. So, you know, why is it happening now? Is it because of, you know, financial, you would imagine, is always a factor to a, a greater or lesser degree. There's the lockdowns in Malaysia. I guess people aren't filling their cars up with petrol. The factories are maybe not, you know, using as much 
you know, oil, gas, and everything else? Is that having an impact? Petronas is state owned. Sepang Circuit is state owned. Um, you, you know, the press release was interesting. It came out from the Sepang Circuit, not the Sepang Racing Team, as such. And the, the press release sort of made clear that it will be a new entity, and, and sort of implied anyway that that the team will separate from the Sepang Circuit. It's like, it sounds like you've agreed, so that's good. Um, and, and so it won't even be called, I guess, the Sepang Racing Team next year. We'll have a new a new name. You know, hopefully they will find some form of new sponsor, but replacing Patronas would be a, a massive task. It, and you would judge by the fact they're closing, as Keith says, the Moto2 and Moto3 teams, that, that they haven't found a suitable replacement. And also the fact that we're hearing there'll be B-Spec Yamahas next year they'll, they'll have. Well, B-Spec, I mean, what are they? I mean, we've got factory spec and A-Spec at the moment. So B-Spec, is that two-stroke? I mean, you know, how... <laughs> I mean, Hang on, you know, it, it, <laughs> it, it, it just gives the impression that, that clearly the money situation is tight. The team will be will be reorganizing, you know, they'll, they'll be resetting and they'll be trying to rebuild for the future. But sadly, that means that the Moto2 and Moto3 teams won't, won't continue. I think what you've got to think about as well, Pete, is that... Um, if they're resetting in the manner that they appear to be and splitting that off, every entity has to actually cover its own books. So Pang International, the actual track itself, doesn't make that much money anyway. They dropped Formula One some time ago in favour of MotoGP. I don't think we're going to have a MotoGP there this year. I mean, I'm, I'm waiting for that to be the next you know, announcement that we get from that part of the world is that Sepang have, have looked at the pandemic situation. I mean, in Thailand at the minute, I noticed the other day that they'd They'd announced, I think it is a 30-day quarantine now when you're coming to Thailand. There, there was something huge that I saw on a press release recently. I haven't checked that, by the way, Pete. No, you're locked down there forever. <laughs> <laughs> but, but obviously, Malaysia, Malaysia, uh, you know, the, the circuit itself doesn't make that much money. So therefore, that's got a tick over it. It's got its own bookwork that it has to account for its money. The race team has to account for its money. Patronus obviously has to account for its money. And at the moment, those three things that were all, all as one are, are not anymore. And, you know, and if they've got to buy bikes, if they're not getting free bikes from Yamaha, if they're not getting free A-spec bikes from Yamaha, and they've got to start leasing them like most independent teams have to in some way, shape or form, um, suddenly your, your costs have gone through the sky again. It's, it's going to be tough time, which is su- I mean, it's such a shame for such a great team that's come from absolutely nowhere, just with the will. I mean, Razlan Razali was, what was he? He was a circuit manager originally, mm-hmm. at Sepang, you know, and then he became CEO and then he became the, you know, dropped that particular handle and went across to, to be the, the top man at the, the race team. Um, he's a very smart guy, but at the end of the day, you, you can only do so much juggling if the money's not there. So I think the only thing we can finish on that one is we wish them well with whatever happens to them, because it will be a great shame if that fantastic vision that they had to put them where they put themselves um just a disaster really the only thing i would just like to add is i I think there's quite a lot of people in in malaysia maybe thinking is this because patronus the the argument that you brought up earlier keith about there's no malaysian riders you know is that why maybe patronus have kind of you know they're thinking we don't want to continue with this but well, all I would say to that is that I think Petronas have been involved in every major decision the team has taken, you know, from choosing Yamaha. That was that was a Petronas decision. Suzuki was also an option um, to choosing the riders. I don't believe they would have signed the riders they signed without the permission or, or the you know the backing, the full backing of Petronas. So I think Razan Mazzali has always sort of made clear Petronas wanted results over the nationality of the riders. So I, I think that particular one... For me personally, I'm not convinced on that. There's a it's lot of talk, of, apparently, among the Malaysian fans. It? It's kind of the next stage, I think, with that kind of situation. When you're moving into your next phase of chucking away, chucking away, investing millions in a racing team, that's when you start to look at the other angles as well. What are the other angles from a, from a political, from a, a local geopolitic, political, I can't even say it right, I need another coffee. <laughs> The race today has blown my head off. Um, but it's a situation where the next phase, what's, they will have looked at the next phase. Now, if there had been Hafiz Shireen or somebody like that that's in the pipeline that's looking good from Malaysia, if there had been that on the ladder, then maybe that could have justified, you could have sold it to them for another you know, three years perhaps. But um, there isn't, so they haven't. And just on the funding thing, the point Keith makes about the leasing of the bikes. <clears throat> in MotoGP, of course, Dorna support the satellite teams, you know, with a lot of money, don't they? I think it's 5 million euros. It's 2.5 million per rider. So 5 million euros a team you get for, for MotoGP. So if you're getting, let's say, these B-spec bikes, they're, they're 
almost certainly not going to be the full two and a half million. That would be the, the factory spec. So therefore, the teams get to keep the change, if that makes sense. And there's quite a lot of change. If uh, you can imagine, if the bikes are, what do they cost? Maybe a million each. You, you know, that's two million on the bikes and you've got five million from Dorna. There's three million that you can put towards the running of the team. That's not the case for Moto2 and Moto3. The, the, the numbers are a lot lower, obviously, because they're, they're of less important. So um, you can actually turn out that the financial side to running a Moto2 team in terms of the money you need to find is not that dissimilar from the money you need to find for a satellite MotoGP team. So that may also be a factor in why, you know, they chose to keep the MotoGP team going. They've got the deal with Dorna for five years. You know, that's that's solid. That's That's got a very good value to it in itself because you can't just turn up and say, put me on the MotoGP grid. Numbers are limited. The deal with Yamaha isn't official, but, you know, it must be happening. There's no other teams left. We assume that will be, what will it be, usually three-year deal. Um, so, you know, so they have got some solid contracts in place, even though they have lost Petronas. So it's not it's not the end of the world, but clearly this will be a major change and, and a new beginning for the team. Most GP just never has really any quiet weekends, do they, anymore? Uh, it always seems like there's some sort of huge breaking news story. And, and just lastly as well, before we come on to the actual race action eventually... I uh, was uh, some of the uh, the fallout from uh, Styria last weekend about the Michelin tyres, which actually came out really and shone into light post our recording. Because I know we got a lot of questions about why we didn't cover it. Well, it's because we didn't know about it at the time. But now we do. So we're going to just briefly talk about it. Because Michelin, especially with Miguel Oliveira, we saw the photos that were revealed afterwards. A big chunk missing from one of those tyres, it seemed almost. So actually, Pete, maybe it's, we should come to you first on this. What were... The, the issues essentially that were going on last weekend and now Michelin have brought they brought some harder tyres this weekend as well and changed it up seemed to fare well but then of course we had different conditions yeah so, so going back to last weekend the, the KTMs in general I, I guess going back to the start of this year they, they've they've been wanting a harder front tyre and the tyre that they really liked last year has sort of been swapped for this asymmetric as they call it so different compounds on either side of the tyre uh, hard front and they sort of were worried that it might be borderline at a circuit like Austria, where it's so hard on the braking. Now, it, it turned out to be okay for all the other riders, but unfortunately for Miguel, it wasn't. Now, when we spoke to Miguel afterwards, he, as he says, he admitted later, he was very polite with his words. He was very careful with what he said. And he just mentioned it. I had to stop. I had a tire problem. And then we see the pictures and there were at least two, you know, big chunks of the tread missing. So it was, it was, it was a fairly significant problem. Now, Michelin reacted to that by changing the hard front tire for what they call a, a symmetric one. So the same compound all the way across, a bit harder for this weekend's race. So the one that, that, that went wrong for Miguel, it was assumed it was a manufacturing defect, but still the whole selection, if you like, of that, op that option was taken out of the selection. This new hard tie was brought in and, and there were no problems this weekend as far as I know. Always tricky with tyres and always tricky for the likes of Michelin. You either you can provide tyres like we've seen Dunlop provide in the past for someone like Moto2, where the tyre is a bowling ball. How many times did we hear that said in, in Moto2? You provide, if it's a one-make tyre, the tendency is to make a tyre that's going to go around and around and around and around for as long as you like and be bulletproof. If you're going to be closer to the edge, which is where Michelin are with MotoGP, and quite right too, it's a prototype series. You're looking for performance, not just from the motorbike, but from tyres as well. If you're going to run it a bit closer to the edge then sometimes it's just a little bit for some manufacturers what always amazes me is how we we end up with you know all these manufacturers all these different technologies on each of the motorbikes and the way the chassis work and we end up with them within a thousandth of a second over a over a three mile lap or whatever it might be it's incredible really and the t and tires have got a lot to do with that you know some tire configurations suit certain motorbikes some configurations suit others the wonderful thing about uh, michelin i think is that uh, the massive overlap that they have between each of their compounds you know the construction of their tires like you know honda like to run the hard construction but that doesn't mean that the the compound that's on that harder construction is less grippy than the softer one it's just it's got a bit more squidged attached to it i'm sorry for the technical term but um <laughs> it worked and that works better on on some motorcycles some riders are you know zarko is notorious for running a, a softer setup than, than maybe some um so when you get a, a bit of a, a, an anomaly like we had with Oliveira with that chunking front tyre, you've seen it before, but you know, Michelin do a fantastic job. And to, to, uh, the problem as well with a place like um, Red Bull Ring is it could be 10 degrees or it could be 60 degrees of track temperature. You know, you're making a tyre that's, that's got to work in somewhere in amongst that parameter. 
then you've got a, a, the fact of the matter is if a tire gets hot, it starts to balloon. And by that, your pressure goes up in a tire. The hotter a tire gets, the, the, the more the, the, the tire starts to balloon and therefore takes away some of that contact patch. So you lose grip and therefore it gets even hotter. So, that, you know, you, you set a tire pressure at the beginning of a race, expecting it to reach X, whatever that working temperature will be. And that will give you the kind of squidge that you want out of the tire and the, and the optimum performance out of it. Go the wrong side of that either side and you've got all sorts of problems. Um, and that really does link quite neatly into this week, of course, when some of them are running slick tyres in the rain, but we'll get there in a bit. Well, it, well, thankfully, there weren't, any, uh, there weren't any defects this weekend. I think we can say that. Uh, but let's get into it then, shall we? Into the race action, because, well, it was, it was all a bit manic, wasn't it? It started with, with the threat of rain right from the very off, but that actually held off for a fair while and allowed us to really enjoy some, some fantastic fighting for the leading spots between uh, Bagnaia, Marquez, Martin, Zarco, Quattararo all having a superb battle for those uh, top positions. Uh, every lap, it seemed to be changing. In the end, it looked like it was Bang Naya who took the lead early on and looked pretty good. And then the rain came down and it all changed in those final few laps. But even before the rain, it was, it was, I mean, how was your heart rate, Keith? Were you all right with it? 